Hello, I'm Carl Benedict, the Director of Research Data Services in the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences at the University of New Mexico. And I'm here today to provide a brief introduction to raster geospatial data and to also introduce some other related geospatial data concepts. Starting with raster data, I'd like to highlight some of the key characteristics of raster data as a geospatial data format. This is a, as a complement to vector data, which are discussed in a separate but related presentation. Raster data typically represent regularly, regularly gridded values across space in that they are essentially a subset of continuous values that have been partitioned into values at regular intervals in an X and Y dimension, creating what you might think of as an image representing those uh, continuous values as discrete values at regular intervals. Examples of raster data include digital elevation models, representations of concentration or density, say of vegetation or uh, animals, and are also commonly used as a representation of reflectance in the case of aerial or satellite imagery, where sensors are used to capture the reflectance of uh, energy, typically light, either invisible or um, non-visible spectra, and capturing the reflectance of that, that light energy from a surface and then being captured by a sensor and written into a data file. The illustration provided here is an example of that, where in this case we actually have three reflectance images in the lower right hand corner of the slide, each representing the um, essentially the reflected energy in three color bands, red, green, and blue, that when combined into a composite representation provides the color image that is provided at the top right hand side of the slide. This relates to the general concept of rasters uh, being either single or multiple band types of data products. So when you're working with raster data, one thing to keep in mind is that they may represent a single set of values, or they may also represent a, a composite data set in which there may be multiple bands or images where there are values for each location within that raster, typically called a pixel, that can be mixed and matched in an analysis or visualization scenario. Given a particular raster data set, other data sets may be derived from those, as illustrated here. This is a digital elevation model for an area around the city of Albuquerque in New Mexico, based on uh, topographic um, data and um, representing the ground elevation for the particular area of interest. One product that can easily be generated from that digital elevation model is a set of contour lines, representing the lines of equal elevation based on the continuous values provided in that digital elevation model. Contour lines are often used to visualize um, in, a, in a vector data format or in a cartographic product the shape of the landscape that in some cases may be easier to recognize through the use of contour lines as a visual cue than trying to interpret the more continuous gradient of values that the elevation model itself represents. Another product that you might derive from a digital elevation model is a hillshade, as illustrated here. Hillshades are often used to provide more visually informative representations of elevation data particularly when they're combined with other base data sets, as we can see here, where the combination of that hillshade hill shade product with the digital elevation model helps to actually provide a little bit more contrast and visibility to the elevation features that otherwise were not quite as apparent 
in the source digital elevation model. These are just some very simple examples of the types of data that can be derived from raster uh, data sources and the, um, the types of data conversions that you might be able to envision converting from a raster data set to a vector data set and by the way also in the other direction as well perhaps starting with a set of contour uh, vector data values and then being able to generate an interpolated digital elevation model as a raster data set based on those. But these are just some simple simple illustrations of how you can use raster data sets to generate derived data products. A core concept related certainly to raster data sets but really to any geospatial data is the concept of how we represent location within those data sets. Because what we're doing when we're um, basically providing coordinates as a part of geospatial data sets, we are essentially uh, flattening the Earth. We're flattening the, the oblate spheroid that is the shape of our planet into any number of alternative representations. So essentially taking that three-dimensional flattened sphere of the planet and converting it into any number of uh, flattened representations of that, where those representations are really mathematical transformations from the locations on that three-dimensional uh, planet into some collection of locations within a, a two-dimensional um, coordinate system. So when we talk about our coordinate systems that we might use for the Earth, there are many that have been developed. And this is actually an um, illustration from the cartoon XKCD, where as a part of um, the cartoon, the artist actually represents a wide variety of different and variable geographic coordinate systems where essentially the features on the planet are then converted into um, locations within an XY coordinate system that is defined by the mathematical transformation from the spherical coordinates to two-dimensional coordinates. So we need to be thinking about this transformation process, which is really a mathematical transformation from that spherical coordinate system into a two-dimensional coordinate system. And some things that we need to keep in mind is that this transformation process then creates the effect of having um, multiple and essentially infinite potential coordinate systems that may be used where the same numeric values for X and Y in one coordinate system are in no way guaranteed to have the same values in a different coordinate system. And we can even go one step far, farther where even the latitude and longitude that we are familiar with in terms of representing locations within our spherical um, uh, planetary uh, coordinate system, those aren't even necessarily constant given that as a part of the definition of latitude and longitude, those are also defined in reference to the definition of the shape of our planet Earth. Some latitude and longitude coordinate systems are based on the assumption that the Earth is a perfect sphere. Other latitude and longitude coordinate systems are based upon a recognition that the Earth is actually wider at the equator than it is across the poles. And that represents a flattening from north to south of the planet. So it isn't actually a perfect sphere, but it's actually a flattened sphere. Knowing what the specific specification of the shape of the Earth is, is key for actually being uh, to, to know whether even latitude and longitude values that you have are comparable between coordinate systems. The bottom line is that you must know the projection 
or the coordinate reference system for any geospatial data that you're working with. If you do not have that information, then you find yourself having to guess about what those coordinates represent, and you may very well find yourself making the wrong choice. We've talked about the essentially infinite number of potential map projections that could be created. So the question comes up of what are the criteria for defining a particular coordinate system? Ultimately, the decisions that are made to define a particular map coordinate reference system uh, is based on what the criteria need to be in terms of the types of distortion that are acceptable or unacceptable in a particular use of those coordinates. And the typical distortions that are going to be present as a part of that transformation from that three-dimensional coordinate system into a two-dimensional representation are um, considerations of area or, rep or, or distortion of the area of features, um, which are typically referred to as equal area projections, those projections that minimize the distortion in the representation of the area of features. Another form of distortion is a distortion of direction or shape of features within the, the transformed coordinate system. In this case, uh, coordinate systems that are designed to minimize these distortions in direction and shape are typically referred to as muthal or conformal types of projections. And finally, um, some map projections are designed to minimize the distortion of distance, and these are often called equidistance or equidistant projections. Depending upon your particular use, you will need to choose a particular projection or coordinate system that will meet your particular needs. So for example, in a navigational application where direction and distance are key characteristics of, say, being able to navigate a ship from point A to point B, you're going to want to use a coordinate reference system that minimizes the, um, the distortion when it comes to direction and distance. Um, typically, you cannot optimize all of these, but in some cases you can have a compromise where you may actually accept distortion in one area or two areas to obtain better fidelity, better accuracy, or less distortion in your desired area. So this is something you always have to think about in terms of choosing the projections that you're using in your mapping applications and, um, and in the decision of what coordinate systems are going to be appropriate for the data that you're producing or using. The transformations between coordinate systems are primarily based upon the geometric form, the two-dimensional geometric form, upon which the three-dimensional Earth is projected. So you could imagine that um, if you have, for example, uh, you might think of a point of illumination at the center of the Earth, and you might put a cone on, on um, you know, over the, say, the North Pole of the Earth that rests essentially along um, a line of latitude. That's, that's one way of essentially uh, treating that point illumination as a way to map the features on the surface of the Earth to corresponding XY locations on that cone that when flattened out will represent those features in, the, in a new coordinate system. A similar process could be used for cylindrical or planar representations where the intersection or relationship between the three-dimensional planet that is just being projected onto those two-dimensional um, coordinate systems again, can essentially be infinite in their possibility, but these are the typical models that are used for um, performing that transformation and defining the mathematical models for that transformation. How do you identify and know what the coordinate reference system is or spatial reference system is? 
There are a number of systems that are used for defining and referencing spatial reference systems. One of the most commonly used are EPSG codes that are numeric codes that have been standardized to represent particular combinations of projection parameters where those projection parameters are the elements in the mathematical formula for transforming between a uh, spherical coordinate system and a two-dimensional coordinate system. But while EPSG codes are commonly used, they are certainly not the only uh, definitions of spatial reference systems that you're likely to encounter. If you're a user of um, ESRI, geospatial data products, you may have encountered .prj files or references to ESRI well-known text or WKT um, as a part of the documentation or associated data associated with a particular data set. These are definitions that ESRI has developed as a way to specify the spatial reference system for the data sets that are in their formats, the formats that they have defined. A commonly used utility for performing transformations between coordinate systems is called PROJ4. And this is built into many geographic information system applications and it, it has implemented the conversion code for taking a set of parameters that define a transformation and performing those, those nu numerical uh, conversions. PROJ4 uses a specific syntax for representing the parameters, the values that are needed to allow for those transformations to be uh, performed. So you may encounter in some instances reference to PROJ4 um, transformation uh, syntax as another way of defining the mapping from one coordinate system to another. Finally, the Open Geospatial Consortium an international standards organization for geospatial data has also defined a well-known text or WKT representation of coordinate reference system parameters. So this is another one that you may that you may also encounter in looking at different data sets. Bottom line is that any given data set may have one or more of these um, pieces of information associated with it defining what the coordinate system is for the data that are in the data set. A good resource for finding geospatial reference information and also for being able to see the representation in these and other common systems can be found at the website uh, provided here, spatialreference.org. Knowing your coordinate system is not sufficient to um, be able to um, have a good understanding of the geospatial data that you're working with. Another key concept or pair of concepts are the concepts of accuracy and precision of location data. Where accuracy is commonly defined as the closeness of a measured or computed value to its true value. Of course, keeping in mind that um, we never know necessarily the true value and we are trying to develop methods that are going to give us the best approximation given the requirements of a particular application. The related concept of precision is associated with this process of determining an accurate location where it is defined as the closeness of repeated measurements of the same quantity to each other. So essentially that has a relationship to the consistency of your instrument in obtaining the same measurements or similar measurements as those measurements are repeated. Both of these concepts are illustrated here in which we have essentially in the first instance, number one represented here, we have a distribution of sampled points where you can see all of the black dots are centered 
around what I have defined here as the true x and the true y value um, it, of the uh, that we have that we in this case know, and we are simulating the distribution of multiple observations of x and y. In this case, with observation number one, where we have actually um, probably a moderate to low um, precision, but we apparently have what what we would probably interpret as a fairly high degree of accuracy in that the composite of these multiple observations are uh, seem to be well centered around the true x and the y value. In contrast, if we look at example number two, represented by the cloud of red locations, the distribution of those sampled locations seems to be about the same as number one, in that um, the precision or essentially the, the distribution of the repeated observations looks to be about the same as we had in our first example. But you can see here that the center of that cloud of red dots seems to be offset some distance from what we have defined as the true x and, value, x and y values. So number two, um, while it has a probably low to moderate um, accuracy, in this case also may have, may be characterized as having a low precision in that it actually represents um, a uh, maybe biased representation of the true value based on repeated observations, where those repeated observations actually seem to be shifted away from the true x and y value. That brings us to number three, where in this case, we actually have what you might think of as a more precise collection of, of measurements in that they are more tightly clustered and the distribution is, is, um, is, uh, is less uh, dispersed. But we have another bias where despite the fact that we have more precise observations, the accuracy is, is also not very good in that we um, have a, a, a bias in this case towards a slightly higher y value and a lower x value away from the true x and y uh, values that are represented by the axes. So it is this combination of accuracy and precision that we need to think about when we're working with geospatial data. How does this relate to geospatial data? Location is the key characteristic of any location that we are that we are encoding within our raster or vector data sets. And we need to think about the accuracy and precision of those data sets with an understanding that in some cases that accuracy and precision may be known. In many cases, it may be unknown. But whether we're using geocoding in terms of estimating geographic coordinates from street addresses, using satellite or aerial imagery where we are hoping that that imagery is properly aligned with a geographic coordinate system, whether we're using um, ground observation systems and instruments like total stations or laser rangefinders, or if we're using um, uh, portable uh, positioning systems like global positioning systems, all of those hopefully have some documentation that characterizes their accuracy and precision. And you should be thinking about accuracy and precision as you are using particular data sets. When we think about these, these values, we can start to also consider what are some of the sources that can contribute for um, bias or errors in the representation of data. Um, keeping in mind also there are choices that are made in the storage and presentation of data that can also introduce bias or reduced accuracy for those data sets. Some of the factors that can contribute to um, that bias are listed here, 
And I encourage you to think about these as just examples of the many sources of potential bias that can be uh, uh, present in the data that you're working with. When we're thinking about map projections, those have a relationship to this concept of bias and uh, bias that is a combination of accuracy and precision in that map proje projections are designed transformations that are balancing a set of objectives that are focused on a particular region and application and that are designed to um, minimize distortion in specific areas of direction, distance, or area that are essentially designed to meet particular application requirements to minimize the um, accuracy uh, issues with the use of those data. And that map projections are also defined in terms of specific units, whether it's meters or degrees, latitude and longitude, feet, um, that is a part of the part of the um, the definition of those projections, and you have to always know what those are. There are an infinite number of potential map projections, each of which has its own characteristic um, strengths and weaknesses, and you have to always think about the differences between those coordinate systems when you integrating data um, into a project, especially when you have multiple data sets. As an illustration of some of the factors that you might encounter, this is a figure from a master's thesis from the UNM Department of Geography from 2011, in which the researcher, um, Laura Ar uh, Lisa Arnold, uh, looked at the different uh, GPS uh, data points that were collected over a 24-hour period at a location that was, had its location independently determined and specifically looking at the distribution of points with the GPS unit operating first in a standard GPS autonomous mode represented by the distribution of the black points that you can see and then also um, a, a separate set of points that were collected using the wide area augmentation system or, or WAS system that is supposed to theoretically improve the accuracy um, of uh, GPS points. In this case, you can see that both sampling methods yielded different distributions of points that were collected over the 24-hour period. And these are illustrations of essentially these concepts of accuracy and precision in the wild. As was illustrated on the slide uh, previously, there are other sources of error, one of which is the uh, map scale, where different maps are produced to accurately represent features on the landscape at different scales, in, which is essentially the number of units on, in the, on, the, on the ground that are represented within a particular set of units on the physical map. The two side-by-side -side examples provided here are a comparison of roughly the same area of the city of Albuquerque, on the left represented on a 1 to 250,000 scale map, where one foot on the ground, um, or 250,000 feet on the ground equals one foot on the, on the physical map, compared to a 1 to 24,000 scale map on the right, which shows a much higher level of detail and has an implicit higher accuracy for the locations of those features within that map. Depending on your application, use of data that are optimized for one scale or the other is going to be absolutely appropriate, but you need to think about that in the, in the context of your particular application. Another illustration of that decision-making process is provided here in comparing two hydrography data sets, both of which um, are designed to depict the network of streams and rivers. And you can see 
that the two are designed to be essentially used at different map scales where number one is showing a much more detailed uh, and um, and uh, and high resolution representation of the the stream beds and their direction and shape where the blue uh, lines represent it represent a more generalized or simplified representation of in this case the major rivers where it does not even include the the secondary streams that are feeding into them why would you choose one over the other in this case if you're doing very um, detailed local mapping, that more detailed and high resolution data set may be um, appropriate so that you can have a more accurate depiction of the shapes of those features relative to other features of the local landscape. In comparison, if you're doing a regional or national mapping or analysis exercise, the significantly higher volume of that high resolution data set may provide a barrier to being able to effectively do your research or do your analysis or visualization where the simplified um, uh, data set that does not include all the detailed features may actually um, be more useful in your visualization and even analytic work at a larger regional or national scale. Again, you have to think about your particular application and context in choosing the scale of the data that are going to be used in that analysis or visualization activity. Finally, I would like to provide a brief discussion of data formats and associated tools. When we're talking about geospatial data, we will typically encounter three different types of data. Tabular data, which are often represented as comma-separated or CSV files. They may sometimes be embedded in a database format, such as DBF, a proprietary but commonly used database format for uh, providing structured tabular data within a, within a file structure. Or we commonly Excel uh, uh, encounter Excel spreadsheets, um, which is a commonly used uh, spreadsheet format, but there are occasionally other spreadsheet formats that we will encounter as well. The common thread for these tabular data is that they are just that. They are data that are arranged in rows and columns that may or may not include geospatial data such as street addresses or latitude, longitude, or other XY values. Another set of common data formats that you will encounter are representing vector data or points, lines, and polygons, often referred to as features, and their associated attributes. So this is a, often a combination of tabular data that are linked to um, those geometries that represent those points, lines, or polygons that may be two or three dimensional features. Common formats that you will encounter for these types of data include um, ESRI shapefiles, keyhole markup language or KML files, or geogra geographic markup language or GML files, where the latter two, KML and GML, are open standards from the Open Geospatial Consortium. Again, there are other uh, representations of vector data, but these three are the ones that you will most commonly encounter. Finally, as we've been discussing earlier, you will also encounter raster data, representing continuous data values that have been partitioned into typically an image format of some sort. That, um, that are at regular intervals representing a, essentially a subset of the, the continuous variation across space. Formats that you will commonly encounter that represent raster data include GeoTIFF files, um, ECW files, and less commonly but still a major player, especially when you're talking about remote sensing or modeled data sets, the NetCDF or HDF. Uh, data formats. These are, these are other formats that you may also encounter. 
One thing to keep in mind is that these are only a sample of the much greater array of data types that you may encounter. But these are the most commonly formats that you will find, and they are the ones that are also most broadly supported by a large number of tools, including geographic information systems, which are analytic and visualization environments that are designed specifically for being able to understand and use geospatial data and information, where they support this range of activities related to the data sets the creation and management of geospatial data, the creation of documentation associated with those data in terms of defining the spatial reference system and being able to um, populate um, standardized documentation uh, formats with information about those data sets. Based upon the geospatial characteristics of data sets, they provide a strong tool for being able to integrate multiple data sets into a single analytic and visualization environment. They often also provide very powerful analytic tools for being able to derive new data sets or new data insights from one or more geospatial data sets that are managed within those systems. Part of this, of course, is being able to do multi-step analyses that can be represented and encoded in those systems as workflows that can be repeated more easily. And this is where the programming aspects of the systems come into play. And finally, these uh, geographic information systems are increasingly able to contribute to or interact with systems that allow for sharing or publication of geospatial data, where they work with web accessible or other syst strat uh, tools for being able to share the data with others, whether it's in standard formats or through uh, open or proprietary protocols for interacting with remote data over the internet. We here have here illustrated on the right examples of just a few of the many geospatial data applications that you might encounter, inclu including, of course, the, um, the GIS applications from ESRI, um, Manifold is another uh, commercial uh, GIS application. Um, Quantum GIS and UDIG are two open source desktop GIS applications um, that are particularly good for integrating um, both data located on your local system and accessing remotely published data using the standards published by the Open Geospatial Consortium. And even Google Earth as a desktop application, as they've now made the Google Earth Pro application freely available, um, that also supports a wide variety of uh, data creation and visualization tools. So with that, um, thank you for your attention and, uh, and, and I look forward to um, hearing how you're making effective use of geospatial data.